as we made our way through the first half of the course and we were dealing with heat and heat transfer, I kept promising you the second half would be better. Uh, it is. It's familiar. It's easy. This slideshow will be uh, not super exciting. A lot of me talking, but you know, let's get the information into your heads. As we get into electricity, we want to talk about what it really is, the concept of electric charge. So we're going to go back to our atom. Let's see, let's do uh, lithium. So I know that we have protons that have a positive charge on them and you know, they're in the nucleus. So let's say we've got three protons in the nucleus here. We have neutrons, which are neutral. They have no charge and they go in the nucleus too. And you know, they may be three, there may be four, depending on which version of lithium we're talking about. Mine has three. And then we have electrons. Let's give them something exciting. Let's make them gold and they have a negative charge. And they happen to be whizzing around in orbit, not the pretty orbit you see on pictures, but they are circling or whizzing <laughs> around that nucleus. Oh, here's a good word, cloud. Should have read my own writing. Okay. Now, because of this, what can move? What can go away from this situation? Nothing that's contained in the nucleus, but the electrons have the ability to move to other atoms. So if you take an electron and you move it away, you're going to have too few electrons and you're going to be left with a positive charge on that atom. Likewise, if you brought in another electron and suddenly instead of three electrons, it's lithium, atom had four electrons, you have more negative than positive, so you have a negative charge. So whenever you have more electrons than protons, you have a negative charge. Whenever you have more protons than electrons, you have a positive charge. And that charge is determined by the movement of the electrons. What else do we need to know? Opposites attract, like charges repel. That'll come in with her transfer of electricity. So here's a picture that someone drew that is much nicer than my picture of lithium. In our first picture A, we have a normal atom. We see three protons and we see three electrons. Nice and normal. In our second situation, one of the electrons has disappeared. So we have three positive, two negative, so an overall positive charge. And we, your word we use to describe that is a cation. It's an ion when it's charged and because it's charged positively, it's a cation. In the third situation, I see these are all A, interesting, uh, we have one, two, three, four electrons, and we have three protons, so we have more negative than positive, so an overall negative charge, it's an ion, so we call it an anion. So how much charge does any given proton or electron have? Not very much. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, so that's like... 18 zeros after the decimal place and one six. Tiny, tiny, tiny. So if you're a proton, you have positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. And if you're an electron, you have a negative charge, negative 1.6. This is too small to be useful to us when we're doing any sort of circuit calculation. So we're gonna create, and they love to do this in SI, make up a unit, we're gonna call it a Coulomb, capital C. And in order to make this workable, we're gonna say that one Coulomb is a charge on 6.25 times 10 to the 18 particles. So you're gonna to gather together, uh, I don't know what's that, a gajillion particles. And when they're sitting together, if a gajillion protons, I know this is not the right number, or a whole bunch of electrons, so let's be a little less silly, you're gonna end up with one Coulomb. And there's how you get that one. Because if you divide 1 by 1 1.6 10, 10 to the negative 19, you get this bad Larry. So when we start thinking about electric current, suddenly we want our electric charge to begin flowing. So we're moving electrons. So when we look in this first pretty picture here, we have these ions, these charged atoms, um, and they are kind of stuck in place. But all the blue electrons can like move around and go wherever they want to go. And at the same time, they're kind of repelling each other. They don't want to be near each other. So when you have a long thin conductor, like a wire, what ends up happening is the electrons move along it, 
creating that current. And I've drawn two arrows because there's both conventional electron flow and like actual electron flow. And one goes from positive to negative, but the real one is actually from negative to positive. I don't care. For our purposes, you can use either direction. The math will work out the same, which is more what I care about. You might recall from our heat unit, we, we moved heat around by, what was it, Conven convection, not convention, <laughs> convection, conduction, and radiation. Now we're gonna move electricity in similar ways, but a little different. So we're gonna look at friction, good old conduction, we know that one, and something called induction. Like Morty here, we've all experienced friction when we rub a balloon on our head, and I don't know anyone who hasn't tried it. So when you rub that balloon, what you're doing is you're taking that balloon and you're rubbing electrons off your head onto the balloon. So the balloon has become negatively charged. What happens? On your head, all your hair is now positively charged. You took all the electrons off. So your hair is all repelling. Each strand is repelling each other, and you end up with crazy hair. And then you do a really neat trick where you can stick the balloon to your head or you can stick the balloon to a wall because all these negative particles will be attracted to the positive parts of the wall. And there's something else going on here that I don't want to talk about because uh, that's another type of <laughs> movement of electricity. But there you go. There's friction. Another way you can move electrons around is by induction, and this will um, be something we explore further uh, with uh, power generation. But on a very, very basic level, if you take something that is charged, so this plastic rod is negatively charged, and you move it in close proximity without contact, because once you contact, things move. It's how the balloon eventually falls off the wall in the previous example. Um, this cloud of electrons is going to force the electrons in the metal plate to run away. So you're creating a little flow of electrons away from your charged object. Once you move the plastic rod back over here, the stuff in the metal plate will rearrange itself to being, you know, normal again. Neutral. Conduction for electricity, very similar to conduction for heat. You take your whatever negatively charged rod, you touch something, Electrons move through contact from one object to the other, and when you pull your first object away, you have changed the charge of both items. You have permanently transferred charge. So this is what you're going to see as stuff goes along a wire. Conduction. After that quick background, let's talk a bit about the components that go into our circuits. All of our circuits are going to have some kind of hot at all times, some kind of battery your battery will have a negative ter terminal, which is called the anode. Notice that's like the word anion for a negative ion. And you'll have a positive terminal, the cathode, which is uh, like cation. And when you draw them, your cathode, your positive terminal can be represented by a longer line. And then your negative is represented by the shorter line. You have some kind of, well, fluid here. It's an acid solution, something that acts as your electrolyte. When you connect everything, you get a chemical reaction going in that electrical light. And what it will do is it will cause the electrons to build up at the anode. So you're going to get too many electrodes, I mean electrons, sorry, at the electrode, at the, <laughs> at the anode. And eventually you're going to create a current as they try and escape that anode and go over to the positive cathode because they are attracted to the positive and repelled by the negative. On the way, we're going to go through a light bulb, some sort of load, and they're going to cause something to happen. Dissipate some, drop some voltage, do some magic. I also want you to know the different types of batteries or cells. Primary is old school. Your big double D battery is in your, in your um, CD player or your Walkman <laughs> from whatever generation certainly not mine. Um, so you get that electric current coming from a chemical reaction, but the chemical reaction is one way only. The battery will eventually die. So this is like I said, your Duracells, your energizers, your ordinary batteries. A secondary battery is much more common today. The chemical reaction is reversible. So you can recharge these batteries. You can recharge and 
automotive battery with an alternator or regenerative braking or a solar battery from the sun. You can recharge a computer battery uh, by plugging in your charger. So the secondary batteries are not done. They don't just go from full to empty. They can cycle through. We also need to add some other things to our circuit. Conductors. We use metal for conductors because they have good electrical conductivity. Also good thermal conductivity, but now we're talking electrical. So copper, silver, aluminum. Would we want to stop the motion of a conductor of, of electricity? We would use insulators like those glass insulators you would see on the old uh, electricity poles, rubber, wood. These are all good insulators. We also like to throw in switches so we can stop the flow of electricity when you open the switch. And we have a little picture of a switch here. Hello. And the last thing we want, the whole reason that we made this circuit is that we can use electrical energy to power something, to convert it to another form, such as heat, light, mechanical power, spinning something, right? So you'll have motors, resistors, bulbs. This is where your voltage drops in a circuit. You make the circuit, so you can power a load with your battery. Okay, so now we're ready to talk a very simple circuit. What could it have? It's gonna have your battery, your energy source, and you can see there's your cathode and your anode. It's going to have a load, something where you're gonna drop the voltage across, that light bulb. It's going to have conductors, which are your wires that you connect things, and it's going to have a switch so you can disable your circuit when you don't want it on. And you'll see here, I finally, I've, here's the terms, conventional current flow, which is what they kind of developed when they wanted to make these schematics, is when electrons flow from positive to negative. But as we know, in real life, electrons actually flow the other way. I don't care. We're getting closer to the math. Here we go. Let's define some things. So electric current is the flow of those electrons through a circuit. And we remember we said charge we wanted to measure in coulombs. 6.25 times 10 to the 18 particles have a charge of one coulomb. And when we send coulombs past a point, when we send charge past a point, we measure how long it takes. We create a unit we call the amp, the amp here. Here it is. One amp here is one coulomb per second. So if you had half an amp, which I'm just going to write as coulombs per second to think of it, how many coulombs would charge with that transfer? Well, it did it for 60 whole seconds, did half a coulomb per second, but did it for 60 seconds, you're going to transfer 60 coulombs of charge with a 0.5 amp current. And let's do the math from start to finish. We know that current equals charge over time. So we're going to have the charge is 75 coulombs divided by 25 seconds. And we're going to get three amps when you send 75 coulombs past a point for 25 seconds. So this current, this charge flowing through the circuit has to lose energy and it's going to lose it in these loads, these resistances we put in. Um, and at these sites, that's where we're going to change that electrical energy into other forms of energy. When you lose this energy, we call it a voltage drop. I use V for voltage. E could be the same thing. Um, once you go through the circuit, you're going to drop all the voltage. So whatever you started with all disappears. And when you come back to your battery, you have zero volts left. So that makes some interesting math things. And if you want to divide, define a volt, it's one joule per coulomb. So once again, we see a joule, which we had used for a measurement of heat. That's an energy, right? The ability to do work, that's energy. Uh, so one joule per one coulomb of charge is a volt. And you're right, we're just making these units up because they work in our things. We're going to figure out how we can calculate the resistivity, resistivity of an object. So let's talk about resistance first. Resistance is the opposition to current flow. So depends on four things. So if, and this is kind of counterintuitive for me, if you have a high temperature, the resistance goes up. 
Number two is more intuitive. The longer it is, the more resistance you have. Number three, the cross-sectional area. The more area you have, the less resistance. So, I mean, we're gonna be talking about wires. So a little wire like that will have more resistance than a big wire with a big cross-sectional area. And it also depends on the material. So just like, you know, all our heat calculations depended on material, there's something called the resistivity, which is the opposite of the conductivity, which is a natural ability of a conductor like to, to be able to move things along. So if you have a low resistivity, that's your stuff like copper, aluminum, and whatnot. Let's get to a formula. All right, resistance is R, capital R. You're gonna get your answer in ohms. Oof, rho, which is like a funny looking P, another Greek letter, and that's the resistivity. L, once again, like we had before, I'm kind of just going to do a loopy L. That's the length of the wire. What unit do I want it to be in? You're going to go look for a length unit in the resistivity, in the, um, the unit for resistivity. So if they give you something blah, 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 centimeters, then you work with centimeters. If it's like blah, 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 blah meters, somewhere in there, then you work with meters. Once again, you're going to have a cross sectional area and you're going to want to be working in the same, you'll have a square unit, but it better be, the base better be the same, right? So centimeters squared, if you had centimeters here, you want centimeters and you want centimeters squared down here. Okay, and you can assume, assume that all of our wires are circular. So most of your area calculations, all of your area calculations, pi r squared. And you'll notice that there wasn't really a temperature in that. And I said the resistivity depended on the temperature or the resistance depended on the temperature. That's fine. The temperature is built into the question. It builds in to the resistivity. Okay, so they have, you know, this wire at 25 degrees would have a different resistivity than it does at 20 degrees. So it's already built in. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, let's list our variables. We have a resistivity is a common one, 1 1.72 times 10 to the negative 6. And I see the units are ohm centimeters. So I want any linear measurements to be in centimeters, any area measurements to be in centimeters squared. This is nice. <laughs> they gave me the area. I don't have to calculate it. Area equals 6.56 .6 times 10 to the negative 3 centimeters squared. And the last thing I need is a length. They gave me 20 meters. I want to be in centimeters because of my units for row. And I'm just going to multiply that by 100 to get 2,000 centimeters. Build the formula. R is equal to resistance is equal to the resistivity times the length divided by the cross-sectional area. Hopefully you haven't forgotten how to do scientific notation on your calculators. 2,000 for the length divided by 6.56 times 10 to the negative three. That's small, but so are wires. And I'm gonna get 0 0.524 ohms. So that's not a lot of resistance, but it's a 20 meter long wire, right? So, you know, it's there. It totally comes into play when we get down to ACDC stuff. And here we go. The last topic of this very, very light intro to our electrical unit, Ohm's law. So Ohm's law relates resistance, voltage, and current. And the idea is that if you want to find it, you get, I'm gonna have the triangle on the next page as well, because I'm addicted to it, V or E, I, R. So one amp is also equal to one volt divided by one ohm. I'm not gonna derive that for you. So that means that voltage is equal to current, I for current, times resistance. Current is equal to voltage divided by resistance, and resistance is equal to voltage divided by current. So that's relationship. So when I look at the picture here, and I see that I have a 1.2 ohm light bulb in a circuit that has 12 volts supplied, and I wanna know what the current is. Oops, that's a cross out, not a highlight. Bear with me what the current is, I'm going to use the equation that solves for current. So I know in this particular one, 12 volts 
divided by 1.2 ohms is going to give me 10 amps, which is, you know, not insignificant, but low, low resistance equals high current. The other thing I want to make sure you do is if you're given something like often you're given milliamps for a current or you're given kilovolts or kilo ohms for um, voltage and resistance, please make sure you convert those back to amps, volts, and ohms. Use the base unit for your calculations. So I'm going to finish that one off right there. In class, we'll do more math examples for resistivity and using Ohm law, Ohm's law to uh, solve simple circuits. And then we'll get into parallel series, combined, AC, power generation, that stuff as we continue on.